It is so thrilling to be here today. My name is Liz Dawn, and I am the co-founder and co-creator of a company called Mishka Productions. Today, this is really thrilling because we have four of who I think are some of the greatest spiritual luminaries of our time brought here together today to offer you a um, sort of a viewpoint of what's of how to get through challenging times and turbulent times in our lives. So without further ado, first up we have is Greg Braden. We also have the amazing Anita Morjani. And next we have Dr. Bruce Lipton. Then we have the wonderful Dr. Shamani Jane. Okay, so Greg, I'm going to start with you. I've got a whole list of questions for each one of you. And Greg, I'm going to start with you. Can you share with all of us today, what is the science behind resilience? Uh, and how can understanding it help us to navigate life's challenges more effectively? You know, Liz, it's a beautiful place to begin. We are all being pushed to the very edge of the way we define ourselves, testing our resilience every day in, in the world, in that, that wild world that's out there. You know, I, it's a big topic, and I, I don't know that I can do justice to it in the brief time that we have here, but I'm, I'm going to do the best I can. When I was a kid growing up in the 1950s and 1960s in the Midwest of this big, beautiful country of ours, resilience meant something very different than it means today. In those days, resilience meant if you had a bad day, suck it up and get over it. I mean, literally. <laughs> and, and people would say that, you know, just, just get over it. Well, we've come a long way since then, Liz. And there's an organization, a uh, scientific organization in Stockholm. It's called the Stockholm Resilience Institute. And they have taken the ideas of resilience uh, and the science of resilience to levels that, that we've never seen before with something that is now called adaptive resilience. So adaptive resilience, the old way of thinking of resilience is you're kind of chugging along in life and something unexpected happens and it, you know, it, it throws you for a loop and, and then you try to get back on course. That's the old idea. Adaptive resilience means you've got your radar up, you're looking at the world and you're saying, hey, this is not the same world that I have known in the past. And so you are making incremental shifts all along the way. But here, here's the key. Those shifts cover five domains of human experience. So let me identify those domains. When we talk about resilience, of course, physiological resilience, you know, that's our, our body, nutrition, exercise, you know, sleep, all of those things. Bruce and I have just come back from, from uh, presenting in Europe. Uh, I have a 30 hour flight, so I'm still searching for my sleep. <laughs> but but that is an important part of, of resilience. Right. Uh, the physiological part, and, and I think we're pretty familiar with that. But then there's psychological resilience. That's separate than physiological resilience. And then there is emotional resilience. There is mental resilience. And there is spiritual resilience. So to be truly resilient in our lives so that we can be the best version of ourselves and be present for those that we love and care about and our friends and neighbors and our families, we've got to cover all, all of these domains. Well, in, in uh, just this the brief time that we've got here today, Liz, what I, I'm, I'm going to zero in on spiritual resilience because I think all of us are being tested uh, spiritually right now. And I know that means different things to different people. Spiritual resilience has, uh, it begins with the way that we think of ourselves, our relationship to the world around us, our relationship to other people, our relationship to our own bodies, our relationship to the cosmos, to a higher power, our relationship to time, to the past, to the future. All of those are part of our, our spiritual resilience. And what I find so interesting about this. This is one of those beautiful places where science and spirituality come together. They cross the traditional boundaries uh, that have, have separated science and spirituality in the past. So the, the, the best wisdom 
of our most ancient and cherished spiritual traditions have offered techniques. Now, the science is telling us why those techniques work. And I know Bruce is going to talk about some of this as, as well on the cellular level. So when we talk about resilience, now I'm, I'm going to use a word and then I'll, I'll define this word. When we talk about spiritual resilience, what we're really talking about is our divinity. And for some people, that uh, word means religion. And I, I can see why it would, because there are schools of divinity teaching uh, religious traditions. But this is, this is fascinating to me, Liz. If you look up the definition of divinity, it simply says the ability to transcend perceived limitations. And that's it. Now think about this. First, it's the ability to transcend. So we're not fighting against anything. We're becoming more than the conditions that we're being shown in the world. Transcend perceived, the perceived conditions, the conditions that we and limitations that we place upon ourselves. They may not even be real, but we perceive them as real through our programming and our filters uh, from relationships and from education and childhood. So divinity is our ability to be the best version of ourselves to create the best world possible. Now, people say, well, you know, give us some examples. What does that mean? Uh, I think many people know I'm a musician when I'm not doing this. And I had the opportunity to go to the Grammys uh, a few years ago and speak with some of the musicians that were, you know, up for the awards. And so I did a little experiment, the scientist that I am, and I wanted to ask these musicians, I said, when you wrote that amazing piece of music, or you wrote the lyrics to that magnificent song, I said, where did the music come from? Where did those lyrics come from? And to a T, every single one of those musicians that I asked, they all gave me the same answer. They said, it didn't come from me, it came through me. Our divinity is a part of us that is timeless, it is ageless, it's not contained in our bodies. We can't be separated from it. You can never be separated from it. This is where our deep intuition comes from, our direct knowing. These are the things that help us to navigate the world in, in a, a healthy way. So we cannot be separated, but we can deny our own divinity because we have free will. And I see people do this all the time. They believe that they are powerless victims of the world around them and that the world is their adversary. And you will see people going through life, blaming everyone else for those things. That's, that's one way to veil our divinity. Uh, another way is our divinity can be programmed out of us through society. The teachings, what our parents, the way our parents help us to think of ourselves, Liz, and and the way our, uh, our friends and our family and our society and our culture and our nation and our planet and our science and uh, you know whatever the, the religious teachings are, they can program us right out of our, of our own divinity. And the last one, and this is up for everybody right now, technology can veil our relationship to our divinity. When we turn to the tools that have been made available to us and use them as crutches, then we are becoming enslaved by the technology. And there's a whole conversation we can have about that. Technology is not good, bad, right, or wrong. It's how we apply it. And we apply it based on our story, the way we have been taught to think of ourselves. So all of these are up for us right now. We are living in a time, and uh, both Bruce and I have been traveling internationally, well, and Anita has as well. I think we've all been traveling internationally. So what I'm saying is true for our global family. It's not just America, or it's not just Europe, or it's not just Texas. It is the whole world that is, is experiencing this. So I want to offer a really, really powerful tool. Your, your divinity, how do you know when your divinity is being tested. And I'm going to give you a little litmus test. When you are inundated with information in social media that triggers a feeling inside of you or a response that betrays your truest nature, when you become something that you are not in the presence of the information that has come to you, that is a, a, a very clear sign that you are giving away your divinity. 
to, to something else. So we all know there's a battle of good and evil playing out in the world. That's no secret. It's been going on for, you know, since the beginning of time. Every once in a while, that battle raises its head in, uh, in more apparent ways. And we're seeing that. And so when we allow ourselves to be divided as families and divided as communities and societies and nations through misinformation and disinformation, that's us giving away our divinity. So I'm going to invite people, I'm, I'm going to stop here in just a minute, but I, I want people to be aware that it's not so much about how we respond to what's happening it's more about what we become in our response what does that response make us into we're all going to get through this time we're going to get through it the key is on spiritual resilience for spiritual resilience do we get through it in a healthy way by awakening the best version of ourselves or we do we succumb to the lowest common denominator and the primal response that is being triggered intentionally through the media that wants to divide us. And I think this is up for everybody right now, Liz. And, uh, and I just want people to just go through your day. Every moment of every day, we choose to either affirm or deny life in, in our bodies through the way we think, the way we address one another, the way we allow other people to address us, how we nourish our bodies, what we do, the information that we take in. So here's, here's the homework for everybody right now. Check the information. Check the, the information that's coming to you and that you allow to come in, into your life and ask yourself, am I choosing life? Is this the best, the highest form of food and nutrition that I can have? Is this the highest response that I have to the person or the people? that are, are triggering me to my family members who are having deep conversations and very different ideas. All of these are facets of spiritual resilience. You hear a lot about all the other resilience. You don't often hear about spiritual resilience. And that's why I wanted to bring this up and, uh, and talk about it. Thank you so much, Greg. That was really beautiful and certainly helped me to kind of land in that place of doing those things that are more honoring for my soul and that don't like throw me off my center. Mm -hmm. So thank you. All right, so Anita, I have a question for you. Could you share how your near-death experience unveiled the profound connection between consciousness and how it's changed your perception of the world and your approach to life? I know that's a big question. <laughs> Wow. But I love that question. What a well thought out question. I am so honored to be among scientists because what I love is that they put the science behind what I'm about to share, which is a personal experience. But even though it's a personal experience, it's one that has changed my life so drastically, dramatically, and profoundly that I I'm on a mission to share what happened to me because I don't think people need to go through a near-death experience to learn what I learned. It's not necessary and I don't recommend it. So that's what drives me to share what I share. And just real quick for the people who don't know my background and what my story is or what it is that informs my thinking, I had end-stage cancer. It was lymphoma that had metastasized. I had tumors the size of golf balls throughout my lymphatic system, which means throughout my body, from the base of my skull, all around my neck, um, under my arms, in my chest, all the way down to my abdomen. And I reached a point where it had progressed over a period of four years where my body stopped absorbing nutrition. I weighed about 85 pounds. Um, I had fluid in my lungs. I couldn't lie flat because I would choke on my own fluid. I looked like a skeleton and I couldn't even hold my head up. I was so weak because my body wasn't absorbing nutrition. I couldn't walk. I couldn't even hold my head up. My head would be hanging down on my neck. And um, I was in so much pain and discomfort because I couldn't sleep through the night because of the fluid in my lungs. And so I reached a point where 
I went into a coma where my organs started to shut down and the doctors told my family that these were my final hours, that I was not going to come out of the coma and my body was already shutting down, my organs were shutting down and I was going through the dying process. But unbeknownst to everybody around me, I had left my body and I had the most beautiful and amazing and freeing experience that I've ever experienced. And the short story is that I was in the coma for about 30 hours. I understood completely why I had been sick, why my body was suffering, why my life had been one of pain. And I immersed, I emerged from the coma 30 hours later. And within three weeks, the doctors could find no trace of cancer in my body. I just had to build up my body physically and eat nutritious food and get strong and build up strength in my legs and so on, which took just a couple of months. Um, but uh, that was in 2006. And here I am um, 17 years later, still sharing my story and telling people about what I learned in the other realm. And it was for me, um, I understood what happened. I understood why I healed. And I feel that uh, there are things that people need to know, which is still not mainstream, which I wish was mainstream, which is why I keep sharing. And one of the first things that I want to share that I learned while I was on the other realm is that most of our diseases are not medical conditions, but they are spiritual conditions. And when I was in that realm, when I realized that, that was a huge awakening for me. It is, it's a case of our spirit, our soul, coming here for a purpose, an intention. And when we squash who we are meant to be, and we compress it and squash it, because I was always a people pleaser. I was always afraid of disappointing people to the point of becoming a doormat. And um, I never allowed my soul or my spirit to be and to shine in the way it wanted to be. So, um, and so when we manifest or when, when there is disease in our bodies, there's usually a reason behind it, whether it's because we are tired from life and are looking for a way out. So our body creates it for us, whether it's because we have built up trauma that we've never healed that have that has accumulated through our lives, or whether it's because we've really repressed who our spirit came here to be. You know, there's, there's many reasons, but all of them are basically what I call spiritual or emotional reasons, which we don't spend enough time uncovering those reasons, because those are usually the real reasons behind our illnesses and our healing. And, um, and so this is why I say that most diseases in our body are not medical conditions, but spiritual conditions. The second thing that I want to say that I really discovered, which helps me to live my life in the way I do, is that each and every one of us, we are a spiritual being. And I just want to say here that what Greg said earlier is beautiful and profound and feeds right into so much of what I, what I say and what I talk about. And what I love about all of them, Greg, Bruce, Shamini, is that they really put the research and the facts into the things that I, I speak about, which I experienced personally and have the medical records to prove that this happened to me on a physical level. So the second thing I learned is that all of us are primarily spiritual beings. We are spirit first, physical second. The physical is a reflection of the spirit. So what does it mean to be a spiritual being? That means that you are born from spirit. You are born, you are a spiritual being when you're born. You go back into full spiritual being when you die. But all the way along, somewhere along the way, we forget that we are primarily spiritual beings. In fact, you are huge, humongous, more powerful than you have ever been led to believe. And I really wish I had several hours to really share with you all um, what, what it felt like in the other realm, because you realize 
that you are far more powerful and you are actually the whole iceberg, but you've been navigating life believing that you're only this little tip, this 10%, and you haven't relied on or leaned upon the, the real important, big, powerful part of you, which is available to you at all times. And that is the part of you that I call the God part of you or the source part. That's the part of you that's connected to God or source and is connected to everybody else. Like we are all connected. Basically, your iceberg is connected to mine and we don't see it's connected because it's below the surface. It's beneath the surface. All of us are connected. We all have access to each other's energies, but we don't realize it. Because we only see that little tip sticking out of the water, we think we are all separate. Actually, every single one of us is a facet of God. And when we deny who we are by repressing and suppressing our souls, when we fear the world, when we say when we become people pleasers and doormats and deny and push down who we are, here's what we're doing. We are actually denying God or source from expressing itself through us. And who are we to deny God from expressing itself through us, through our physical bodies? We are here as a facet of God or source to express ourselves to our fullest. That's number one. Number two, the fact that we're all connected beneath the surface, when we see each other as enemies, what we don't realize is all of us are facets of the same whole. If we think of ourselves, all of us, as one whole, one giant organism, expressions of one giant organism, when we see each other as enemies, when we attack each other, we are attacking the very organism that we are part of. And so what I like to talk about and remind people of, because this is the, a huge thing that I learned, is that because I learned we're all connected and because I learned that when we die, when we die, when we cross over, we realize, I realized that all of us are part of the same whole. And I realized that things like... Um, it, I realized what truly matters. And here are the things that really matter in life. The first thing that really matters is, is love. It's really about how much did I love? How much connection did I, did I have with everybody else in love in life? Because when we are so obsessed with competitiveness, with trying to get ahead of everyone, being right, as opposed to, as opposed to being compassionate or being right, as opposed to being kind. When we're so obsessed with seeing other people as being our enemies, we realize only after we die that we focused on the wrong thing. We focused on the things that made us miserable. And so I now realize that when we die, for all of us, it doesn't matter which side you were on. It doesn't matter whether you're currently, if you're in America, whether you're on the left or the right, or if it doesn't matter which news channel you follow or which newspaper you read. People that don't watch the same channel as you are not your enemies. People that don't read the same news station as you are not your enemies because when we die, we realize that all of us are part of the same organism. And as Greg said, this is a test. This is a test to see if we can be resilient enough to actually come past it and see through it, see through this fear that mainstream media is constantly feeding us, see through the fear that every, um, I would say every huge uh, infrastructure is feeding us, everything from the fear that mainstream medicine, the pharmaceutical companies feed us, the mainstream news media feed us. See through that fear and see that in actuality, we are all part of one organism and collaborating is far more powerful than competition. So these are the things that I learned were really important on the other side. 
And I just want to give you all some tools on how to see through this. We are actually the creators, the co-creators of this physical life. And it, we come from soul first. What we see here in the physical life is a reflection of who we are. So when we see an outside world that we're not happy with, instead of going out and trying to change the world, the best thing we can do is to look at who we are from the inside and work with who we are. Because when we can work with who we are and expand our own energy, we become a beacon of light. We start to actually impact other people just by our presence. But when we go and fight against what we don't like and what we see outside in the world, we're actually adding to the anger. We're actually giving them fuel to fight back even harder. So the, um, so the metaphor I like to use is if you imagine yourself looking in a mirror and imagine you don't like what you see in the mirror. Now imagine in order to resolve what you don't like what you see in the mirror, you start attacking the mirror or you start painting something different in the mirror because you don't realize that what you're actually seeing is a reflection of you. So the change starts with us, each of us, because each one of us is a cell of this living organism that we call life and the planet that we all inhabit. Next up, and I want you all to stick around because all of our teachers today have something super special to share with you at the end of our conversation today. We have the fabulous Brucey Lipton. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so happy to be here with you. First of all, let me acknowledge that our wonderful audience out there. I acknowledge them because they're the cultural creatives that are here to help make a change on this planet. And I say, what do you mean make a change? Well, I can give you a very simple fact. Science has recognized today a very important uh, uh, piece of information, and that is to sustain the world right now. If you just want to keep everybody living just the way we're living right at this moment, it takes 1.6 planet Earth to provide the resources. Well, there's a clear problem here. We don't have an extra 0.6 planet. And so what does it mean? It says we're living beyond our ability to support ourselves, that Science has recognized, and uh, NASA scientists have actually put a date on it to say within the next 20 years, and probably faster, industrial civilization, the one we're in, is facing, and let me emphasize the word, irreversible collapse. In other words, we're not going back. We have to move forward. And I go, so what's the point? And I say, well, why do we have a problem on the planet? Today? Chaos is everywhere all over the planet. You can look at each little chaos as some special event. And I go, no, you're missing the fact that there's an overriding bigger thing we have to deal with. And that is we are not sustainable. The first thing we have to understand is knowledge is power. Yep, that's a fact. We also must recognize the corollary of that is a lack of knowledge is a lack of power. And then one more aspect, and that is a misperception is disempowerment. And one of the biggest misperceptions that the world is suffering right now from is the belief that genes control your life. We've been programmed since 1950s that genes are the uh, blueprints that unfold and our life is created. And I say, what did we learn from that scientific story? And the answer is, well, as far as we know, we didn't pick the genes. <laughs> if you don't like your characteristics, you can't change the genes. Then we just add them one more. And that is they turn on and off by themselves. And I say, put all that together. And I say, what is the result of that consciousness? And the answer is, we are victims. We are victims of our heredity. The people look in their family and say, oh my God, there's cancer running family. I can get the cancer, Alzheimer's. I can get this, I can get that. Well, here's a very important fact. And Anita brought this up and I just want to emphasize it from a scientific point of view. And that is simply this. Yes, the world is in a health crisis right at this moment. And I say, well, what's responsible for this health crisis? Well, we've been emphasizing that there's a breakdown in the body and that the pharmaceutical company is going to help us repair the body. And I go, a complete misperception, disempowering fact. Significance is this, less than 1% of disease is even connected to genes. I go, so where's disease coming from? Stress. I said, well, how does stress affect us? So I say, well, there's a new science. 
And that new science, a lot of the people in this community right now are very familiar with, but if you're not, it's one of the most important new understandings and corrects a misperception that has disempowered us. And that is the science called epigenetics. I go, what the heck is that? Well, you've been programmed that this character X is under genetic control, genes control X. The new science is called epigenetics. So I would say, yeah, epigenetics controls X. And I go, yeah, but it sounds the same. I go, no, no, here's the difference. Epi, epi means above. We call skin epidermis because just under the skin is a layer called dermis. So skin is above epidermis. So I say, this character is under epigenetic control. I say, what does it mean? Control epi above the genes. And all of a sudden it says, wait, you've been programmed to believe that genes turn off and control your life? 100% false, 100% false. Genes don't create the activities, they respond to the activities. And I go, so what, what's controlling all this? Well, let's, this is what I really want to emphasize in our program. And again, I love looking forward to this program because uh, all of us on this panel right now are active participants uh, collaborating to provide a whole new science and a whole new vision and a whole new knowledge. Knowledge is power uh, about how to get through the current moment. Well, number one is epigenetics. And I say, what's important? It says control epi above the genes. I say, what is it? Well, it turns out like this. Our thoughts, pictures in your mind, are what we have thoughts about belief or what we think about the world. You have a picture. Oh, life is good. Life is not good. I'm going to get sick. I'm not going to get sick. I say, these are thoughts. I say, yeah, but what? The brain's job is to translate those thoughts into what is called complementary chemistry. So in other words, a thought of love uh, causes the brain to relieve some wonderful chemistry in your body, uh, dopamine for pleasure. This is why we like being in love. Uh, we also get oxytocin coming out and that bonds you to your lover. Uh, uh, when you're in love, you also release chemistry from the brain called growth hormone, which does what it says. When we fall in love, we enhance our vitality. And that's why when people fall in love, they say, oh, see how in love they are. They glow. I go, that's the chemistry that's coming from the thought. If you have a picture of fear, uh-oh, the love chemistry doesn't come out. Fear chemistry comes out. It's a different chemistry completely. It's uh, associated with stress hormones. I go, stress hormones? I go, yeah. And here's the fact. 90% or more of illness on this planet is all due to one thing, stress. Stress means that you have difficulty in seeing the harmony in your life and that things don't look very good. You feel threatened in your life. And these are thoughts. The thought is, traded, uh, is turned into the stress hormones, such as cortisol. And the cortisol is then adjust your biology for protection because fear means protect yourself. And so we're living in a world where there's so much to fear whether it's the idea of COVID or whether the idea is maybe your job's not going to last or the money's not going to be there or you're not going to have money to take care of yourself or you might be living on the street. Fear. I say, so what? I say, fear chemistry shuts down the biology for protection. I go, why? <laughs> What's the reason for that? I go, well, protection from the original day, run away from that saber-toothed tiger that is threatening you. So I say, so why is this important? Uh, and the answer is this. When we are in stress, the stress hormones switch the energy of the body, not from growth, but into protection. I say, well, what's the difference? I say, well, growth is open. You want to take something in, your nutrition. You want to take love in, that's growth. You have to take it in, you're open. I say, but protection, that's the complete opposite. Protection is you close yourself down. I said, well, to give you some information that we're going to really expand on and go deeper into, uh, number one, I said, well, what does it mean protection? I said, well, that means you want to be ready for fight or flight. And I go, well, in school, we call that the adrenal system. I go, yeah. I said, what does the adrenal system do? It makes sure that the arms and legs get the most blood they can get. And I said, why? Because blood's got the energy in it. So if you're going to run away from that tiger, you want all the blood you can get into your arms and legs to energize you to get away. So I said, well, what is the consequence? Now, listen to I'm going to give you just three consequences of that stress hormone that's running through your system when you look at the world. Number one, 
the stress hormones cause the blood vessels in the gut to squeeze shut. I go, why? Because when the blood vessels are squeezed shut, the blood is pushed to the arms and legs. Matter of fact, when you're in a moment of fear or stress, you can feel the blood vessel shutting down. It's called butterflies in the stomach. It's the queasy feeling when you feel a little fear going on. I say, what's it doing? Squeezing the blood vessels, push the blood to the arms and legs so we can start running and save our lives. That's number one. Number two, what else does stress hormones do? They shut off the immune system. Why? Well, the immune system is internal protection. You're trying to save yourself from the tiger that's out there. I mean, if you have an illness and the tiger gets you, uh, you don't have an illness anymore, do you? Uh, and the relevance about all this is very simply that to conserve energy, we shut down the immune system. And I say, why? And I say, oh, if you've ever been sick, you probably didn't even have the energy to get out of bed. Well, if you have a bacterial infection and you're supporting that with your energy and you're being chased by a saber-toothed tiger, you might want to consider where do you want the energy? The heck with the bacterial infections. Why? The tiger catches you, bacteria are not your problem anymore. So I say, stress hormones shut off the immune system to conserve energy. It's so effective that when doctors want to transplant an organ from person A into person B, they don't want the recipient's immune system to reject the foreign organ. They give the recipient stress hormones before the operation. Why? It shuts down the immune system. So number one, you shut down the growth and maintenance of the body by shutting off the blood vessels in the gut where all the organs are. Number two, you shut down the immune system, which means now you're really open for a problem. And number three, you actually shut down the intelligence. The uh, stress hormones cause the blood vessels in the conscious brain behind your forehead squeeze shut because it pushes the blood to the hind brain where reaction is necessary. So I say, let's put the three together. Shut down the gut maintenance of the body. Shut down the immune system protection of the threats inside the body. Shut down the intelligence, and then you become a victim. So I say, then where are we in the world? We're seeing chaos all over. The stress of that is at every different level in every different country, whether it's economic, political, social, religious, racial. Stress is causing all the chaos. And I say, but here's the important point. As NASA scientists said, we're facing an irreversible collapse because of the current system. It's the way we've been living that is causing our own extinction process. So what does it say? It says the only way to survive is to break down the old system that is causing the problem and build a new system that we can not just survive, but thrive into the future. So the stresses you're facing are actually saying, no, it, current life is threatening. And that when you're in that stress, that's where the health crisis comes from. And I say, and we have to move out and we have to build a new one. Don't fight the old system. It will suck all your energy and you won't change it. What we do in this case, and Buckminster Fuller told us that he said, don't fight the system, go build a new one. Well, what do you think we have 8,000 people on this line for? because we're all looking for the new one. And I want to add something because uh, I want to take Anita's story, which is so profound, and just bring another look on it. And that is simply this. As a scientist for 40 years of my life, I never believed in spirituality. I believed in genes and chromosomes and cells and proteins. But my study of the cells reveals something that was so profound. It, it transformed my life in an instant. I said, what was that? It goes based on this. You cannot put your cells or organs into another person's body. I go, why not? Because their immune system will say that transplant is not self. Go, wait a minute. The immune system is reading something that says Bruce on it versus, let's say, Greg or Anita. I go, well, what is it reading that knows me different from all the other people? And here it is. On the surface of your cells, there are proteins. They're like antennas. They're called self-receptors. There's a bunch of them. I say, what do they, they do? Well, they're receivers, self-receivers. I say, well, what do you mean? I said, well, they're getting a self-signal. I say, well, where, where is it coming from? The receptors are on the outside of the cell. I say, well, what does that mean? I say, well, then who you are is coming to you and your receptors are picking it up. And I say, well, why is that important? Because as we're going to get into in the program, quantum physics, the most valid science on this planet, 
recognizes that our consciousness and our spirituality is running the show. And I said, spirituality, I go, oh my God, the cells are reading your identity. There are no two people in the entire world with the same set of receptors. I say, yeah, but what are the receptors reading? Environmental signal. So analogy is very simple. Consider yourself, uh, your body as a television set. So in this case, hey, thank you for watching the Bruce show on this television set. But I say the broadcast of Bruce is not in the television, just like your show is not in the television. It's received by the television. So I say, so, yeah, so what? And I say, well, you're watching the TV. The television breaks. And I go, yeah, the television is dead. But here's the question. Did the broadcast die when the TV broke? And the answer is nope broadcast is always there and guess what if a future embryo shows up with the same receptors that you have you're back why your identity is the field your identity is not the television set you are a spiritual energy and i go a spiritual energy i go spirit i go physics refers to all the energy that we're immersed in like an aquarium of energy they call it the field i go what's the definition of the field invisible moving forces that influence the physical world i go <gasps> spirit definition invisible moving forces that influence the physical world and in fact today at this time quantum physics the most valid science on this planet has acknowledged in journals especially the journal nature the most prestigious scientific journal on the planet there was an article from a physicist richard con henry and I just need to read the last line to you because it's like in the most prestigious scientific journal. And it goes, the universe is immaterial, meaning it's energy. The universe is immaterial. It's mental and spiritual live and enjoy. I go, oh my God. And again, most prestigious scientific journal, Nature, the universe is immaterial, meaning it's made out of energy. The universe is immaterial. It's mental and spiritual. Live and enjoy. Well, this is exactly the message that each of us on this committee, panel, group, whatever it is, is trying to reveal to you, each from a different understanding, a different perspective. So when you put it all together, you get to understand this. As Anita said, you're not the body, you're the broadcast. The broadcast, that's the energy. All of the energy, call God. What are you? A piece of God. Can you be separated from God? No. Why? It's your broadcast that's picked up by your receptors and nobody can interfere with that. I am so excited that you're here because I have been fascinated with your work since the minute I was introduced to you because I love saying the word psychoneuroimmunology. And Dr. Shamani is the one to talk about psychoneuroimmunology. <laughs> now I can't say it. So the acronym is PNI, is that correct? Yes, because nobody can say the word psychoneuroimmunology. And there's even the endocrine system. So if you say psychoneuroendocrinology, immunoendocrinology, you know, it's, it goes on and on. So that we have a joke, Liz, if you can say psychoneuroimmunology seven times really fast, you get your degree. Oh, God. <laughs> I think I could but do mostly it. we will just say P and I or P and E for short. And Brucey did such a great job of kind of describing these pathways. Most of us think about psychoneuroimmunology as it relates to stress, because as scientists, typically scientists like to study the negative. Unfortunately, we're changing that a little bit. <laughs> But, you know, we Brucey talked a lot about what happens in the stress response and how it constricts our blood vessels, how it shifts our brain chemistry. And this field of P&I is actually pretty new, believe it or not. 60 years ago, if a doctor went to a scientist or vice versa and said, you know, I'm noticing a pattern in my patients and I'm noticing there are certain dispositions or things that they're struggling with in their life and their relationships, and I think that's related to their illness, they would have been laughed at 60 years ago, but because of the work of really wonderful scientists who came together to share what they were learning, we have this beautiful field and we've learned so many things, not just how stress can you know, affect our bodies in negative ways, but also 
speaking to what Greg and Anita were sharing about resilience and spiritual resilience, we're just beginning to come into deeper awareness of that. So we know from the science that there are things that we can do to reharmonize the body, even when we're faced with stressful circumstances. And I just wanna say, Liz, this isn't actually new. For Western science, it's new. This idea that, oh, my environment and my diet and my movement and my emotional, spiritual, energetic well-being affects my body. Well, it turns out that indigenous medical systems across the world have known this for eons, and it's actually the base and source of substance in Chinese medicine, African medicine, Ayurveda. Now we have these fancy terms again in the West, we're starting to use the term whole person health, right? Looking at the whole person, but as Anita and Greg also shared, it's not just whole person, it's whole people. <laughs> because, you know, tying it into what Bruce was saying, what we're learning and what I feel is really the exciting extension of psychoneuroimmunology is yes, it's diet, yes, it's sleep, it's you know, all these things that we know, but it's also our energy and tapping into our energy. And that's what I've been so passionate about for decades studying this area that in the West, we like to call biofield science, literally the immaterial universe and how it connects with the material because you know, I know I've seen a lot of things in the chat. Okay, great. Well, how do I do it? How do I navigate these challenges? How do I do it? And I really, truly believe that a powerful tool that we have that most people aren't probably using enough is coming back into the connection with our energy to free the spirit. Connect with energy, free your spirit, transform your life. It's really that simple. And I really want to I want to share this with you all because this is so fantastic. Now, my dear colleagues know I'm out here right now in San Diego filming for a beautiful documentary on healing that my nonprofit, the Consciousness and Healing Initiative, is putting together. So we're interviewing patients, we're interviewing integrative health practitioners, scientists, and doctors. And yesterday we had this very interesting experience where we were um, interviewing a curandera, and then I asked for a limpia. So if those of you may be familiar with what a limpia is, it's a cleansing ritual, a deep cleansing ritual um, to help just sort of clear away, right? Because that's a lot of what we're talking about. And so speaking of psychoneuroimmunology, you can see here the fields of energy that came. Now, this was not random. This rainbow actually appeared, this was yesterday, when Grace Sesma, the curandera, called upon my grandmother ancestor spirits to assist in the clearing. That rainbow wasn't there before. And it actually, we have pictures because my producer just happened to see it and started snapping pictures. So it started small and then sort of grew and encircled us all. It really, I mean, that is, it encircled both Grace and I during the healing process. And I wanted to share that with you all because First of all, it's beautiful to see that we're always surrounded by grace and we don't always see it with our own eyes, but it's there for us. And the spiritual reserve, the spiritual resilience that Greg is talking about is not just the leading edge of psychoneuroimmunology. Psyche means spirit. And as a scientist, we know that it's important for us to study the effects of the non-material the connection with the fields of energy and information that connect us and heal us. So there are amazing studies really pointing to how when we connect with energy healing, whether we do it with ourselves and we can do a practice um, or we have someone else help us like an Olympia situation like this, what happens? We realign with our spiritual nature. We know that we're not alone. We can literally feel the shift in our energy, bringing us back to the core being of ourselves and feeling each other without the sense of division and tension. And so it's all about really engaging in that practice and knowing that your ability to heal as Anita is a living embodiment of and teaches is beyond anything that you might even imagine. It's infinite. Um, and so that's really what psychoneuroimmunology is about. You know, I've had the honor and pleasure of having several conversations with you. And one of the things that, that you did during our conversation is that you took me and several hundred thousand people, <laughs> whoever was tuning in at that time, through a process. And it was so 
exquisite because I could feel my whole body just settling in. And I would love for all of you, all of you that are here joining us today to experience this. So I've asked Dr. Shamani to share that process with us and um, everyone maybe stop typing for a few moments. If you're driving, don't do this, <laughs> but would you be willing to share that process with us right now? Yeah, absolutely. And, and just a, a little bit of preamble. First of all, I know we've been sitting for a while. So if anyone wants to get up and I'll just demonstrate because, you know, the hips, you can stand up for part of this if you want to just, you know, make sure that your hips are loose and you're really feeling your legs. Now, let's talk a little bit specifically. What I want to talk about is transforming fire into light, because that's part of the calling. It's not that fire is bad. Fire is great. It moves us to action. It's one of the elements. We have many elemental forces and energies that work through us um, and through our bodies. And we're always looking to harmonize that. That's what all these indigenous medical systems do for us. And it turns out we can do that with our mind and our focus to connect with our energy in that way. So this practice is really gonna be about connecting with what's here and opening to expand to the light, to the rainbow, like that I just showed you, right? Because again, we're supported. And part of um, our charge, as Greg says, is to enhance our spiritual resilience. And Anita says to remember that we're deeply interconnected. We are unity and diversity. So how do we do that? Well, first we wanna get grounded. What do we know about fire? Well, and I mentioned fire because we talked about stress. We talked about all of these crazy things that are going on in the world. I've seen lots of things in the chat. How are we handling things that are going on in Gaza? How do we handle the crime, the murders, the, you know, all these things? Yes, there is a lot of suffering. And when we feel indignant about that suffering, it brings up a fire in us. And so the question is how we work with that in a way that is actually gonna promote harmony and not more discord. So let's take a moment and just make sure we're grounded because what do we know about fire? How do, you, how do you kind of harmonize a fire? You can use earth, you can use water. So first we get grounded in the body. And I'm gonna invite you whether you are choosing to sit or stand to just first allow the breath to deeply come into the body through the nose. You can close your eyes or keep them open in a pleasant place in the room. But just notice your breath. No right or wrong way to breathe. Just notice what's here. And now see if you can bring with your awareness a noticing of your breath into the belly area and below. Some of you may be familiar with the Hara point, which is just a little below the belly button. If you like, you can anchor there. You can also anchor your breath in your hips, in your bladder area, just so that you're deeply breathing all the way into the lower body. And letting that nourishing, cooling breath flow down the legs and out the feet, grounding yourself into beautiful Mother Earth. And so just feel your breath really resting here in the lower body. And now to enhance this release, I'm going to use a little sound. Sound is consciousness. And sound connects and moves energy. So here, I know that we all won't hear each other. So I'll demonstrate and you can giggle, but I really want to encourage you to make your own sound. And I find that nourishing sounds here to stimulate movement and flow in the energy body. Our vowels like ooh, and uh and so when we use these vowels we're really placing the sound again in the lower body you can move the energy down the legs or place the sound at the base of the spine however you like so we'll start with just a simple ooh 
Let's do this two more times. Making your own inner sound allows you to meet yourself in a very beautiful and gentle way. And as you can see, just by using this bass level ooh sound, you might feel more of a resonance in your lower body. And I'd love for you, if you want, you can throw it into the chat, anything that you're feeling during this. But also, if it takes you away from the practice, don't do that. We'll have time to talk later. But now that we're a little anchored in the lower body, we're really present in our bodies because our physical bodies are a gift, right? Psychoneuroimmunology teaches us much of what Anita is saying. Our physical bodies are a representation of our spirit, a vehicle for facilitating beautiful change and creation, right? We're all conscious co-creators in embodied form. So honoring the body in this way is a wonderful place to start. And now we can begin to expand even further from me to we, by placing some attention and focus and energy up the body into the heart center. So now we're just going to take a moment and you can place your hands here in the heart center if you want. While we do this and again, just reconnect with your breath here in the heart and the lungs. Gently breathing in and expanding. And I will wager that as you do this, just the even the simple breathing, paying attention to the front and the back of the heart, recognizing that we're creating a resonant field right here and now with each other. Because the biofield teaches us that healing occurs across time and space. And then we can enhance this resonance by all chanting together even if we don't hear each other, I guarantee you we will feel each other. So we're going to place a simple seed mantra to begin with that you're probably familiar with, Om. And when you chant this, think of the relief that opening the heart can give. And you already know this. Think about what happens when something is relaxing or you take a nice breath and you go, ah, right? So you can even do this a few times, just ah there's a nice sigh again a release everything is about the movement of transformation maintenance and creation that cycle of time and life ah and the sigh is all of that right the inspiration the movement and the flow and the ebbing and the flowing so with that same feeling of the ha ah, we chant the om as almost an ah so i'll demonstrate and we'll do this a few times together and really just allow the heart to expand and connect. We're all connected here through this beautiful sound. Ah. Feel the sense of expansion and peace that you just co-created. And in our final moments here of collective practice, if you would like to invite any guides or ancestors to be with you during this time we have together and even beyond, 
throughout the day. Keeping your attention and your focus here on the front and the back of the heart, invite them in. And it can be as simple as spirit, please be with me. Feel the shift. And allow for anything that wishes to be released to simply release from you. Replenishing renourishing every cell of your being and grateful, grateful for the opportunity to come into collective practice in this way. Take a moment to thank yourself and your guides for coming into collective practice together. And when you're ready, if you've had your eyes closed, you can open them. I I learn something every time I hear from my dear friends and colleagues, even though we've known one another for decades. I, I always learn something new. I did a quick calculation, and we are right now, between the four of us, we have 140 years of collective wisdom that we are offering. And that's, you know, it's obvious that we all have a lot to share. Community, I know you've heard a couple of the speakers refer to something where we can expand on that sharing. And that something is uh, precisely what I want to talk to you about right now. We wanted to give you something today that you could use immediately. You can walk away from this and have new insights into your, your relationship to the world around you and practices that you can do. We're having a tough time in the world. The world's a tough place. We wanted to give you something meaningful for you and your family. And if what we have done speaks to you and you want to take that deep dive. Uh, my experience is that a retreat experience is the way to do it. What does that mean? It's, it's when we come together as a community and we have sessions at odd hours. We have night sessions, we have day sessions, we have breakout sessions. A lot of time with the four of us uh, interacting together which rather than just one after another, after another on the stage, so everybody's raising or, or nodding their head. We, we wanted to do this. Yes. So I, I wanted everyone to know if this kind of information speaks to you, there's an opportunity. We would be so honored to be able to share this with you. And the reason is we love you. And I'm, I'm not just saying that because we're here together today. We're in this together. This is a rare and precious moment in the history of our planet, in the history of our civilization. We've never seen anything like what we're seeing in the world now, every one of us is going to have to be at our absolute best. We've got to be healthier than we've ever been. We have to have more resilience. We've got to have rock solid spiritual anchors uh, and, and an, an emotional compass to guide us in a healthy way. We're all going to get through it. We want to get through it in a healthy way, not to survive, but to transcend, to become more than everything that we're seeing here. And that's that's what this is all about. I just wanted to add this, Brother Greg, and uh, dear sisters, and our friend Liz Dawn, thank you for putting all of this together. And Greg is right. We are facing uh, a planetary upheaval. Knowledge is power. And what the four of us offer is self-empowerment. We're going to provide you with the knowledge where you can have your power back, because as I said, We've been programmed with some misperceptions that have taken our power away, but this is an opportunity to clear up those misperceptions and to get new knowledge and new power. So uh, we would be so excited to see you there. And if you can't make it, it's still in the field, folks. Um, the Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh was always fond of saying that a person without a Sangha or a spiritual community is like a drop of rain in the desert. And what that means is, you know, as we come to understand our interconnection, having these opportunities to come together in real time and space is, is incredibly, it's a privilege, it's an honor. It's, of course, it's a privilege and honor for me to be among Greg and Anita and Bruce for this. I, I do have to say, 
you can imagine, you probably get the sense we're all pretty busy. <laughs> the last time we did this was over a year ago, and it's taken us this long to get our schedules together. If, if you feel called to come into retreat, I would um, strongly encourage you to consider this because it is um, a very rare occurrence. And the feedback that we got from the last time we did this is still, I still have people coming to me and talking to, to me about how their life literally just shifted after that. Um, so, and I just want to thank everybody who came today to be with us. And I think we can already start to feel the transformations and those will continue to move with you throughout the day and the weekend, of course. I just, I want to chime in here because when we talk about the kinds of things we're talking about, uh, we, all of us often hear from individuals, who, they question their worth to receive their divinity, to open to their, their deepest, their deepest potential, the extraordinary potentials, you know, that, that live within us. So I'm just going, I'm going to address that in just a couple of sentences. In 2004, there was a, a discovery that, that speaks directly to this. And that discovery was the scientific fact that our DNA, our genome is not random, that there is information that lives within our bodies. We carry it in the 50 trillion cells in our bodies. And the first layer of that information speaks to everything we're talking about here. Because everyone listening to this, I want you to know, there's a message that you've carried from the time of your conception in every cell of your body. And when we translate it, it literally says God eternal within the body. God eternal within the body. So when we talk about spiritual resilience. And when Anita talks about we're all part of one, what is it that we're part of? We're part of God eternal within the body. And I think when people ask about their worth, and this is what I want to leave people with today. Whatever challenge faces everyone, I'm going to invite you to think about it from this perspective. How would God eternal within the body solve this challenge rather than looking at the limits and the perceptions of the programs of the past? And this, this is what we will be doing also. At, at, uh, when we are together with hundreds of hearts, those heart fields, literally electromagnetic fields, coalesce into a greater convergence that opens the door to deep states of intuition and healing. Uh, I don't know any other way to, to do it. So Liz, thank you. Anita, Shamani, Bruce, thank you for sharing part of your day. And I, I wanna thank everyone who's tuned in and stayed with us for this whole, this whole thing today.